Heavenly Father, we come before you and we thank you for giving us some time in your word. We ask that your Holy Spirit would instruct us and teach us, that you may bring understanding to our hearts and lives, and that you may make application of your word into our lives and throughout our life as we live for you. So we thank you for this time together, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're in Galatians chapter 3, and we left off in verse 14. We talked uh, about the blessing that God has for us, and this blessing comes to us by Jesus Christ. And the blessings of God are just incredible to hold on to, to research, to understand, to trust in, and to hold dear. And here, as Paul is writing to the Galatians, there's these Judaizers, these people that have migrated into the church from Antioch, and they had come from Jerusalem as well. And they migrated into the church and they were teaching, oh no, it's not just by faith in Jesus Christ, it's not by that. That starts everything, but you got to do good and keep the law and be, you know, circumcised and you got to follow all the things that the Mosaic law would indicate. So Paul keeps coming against that theology, that teaching, and letting them know that, no, the law wasn't set in place to perfect you. The promise was made before the law. The hope of the seed, the heir of Abraham, that would bring righteousness was given way before the law and before Abraham being circumcised or set apart. And so he keeps going back to that, that it's very important that we hold on to that truth. And so he continues this discussion in the rest of this chapter. And so we're just going to continue and move right through it as we look in verse 15. 15 in Galatians chapter 3, it says this, Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be put uh, but though it be but a man's covenant, yet it be confirmed, no man disnulleth or addeth thereto. First of all, when Paul is having this discussion with the Galatians, he approached them and declared that they are brethren, that they were believers in Christ. <clears throat> they may have been misguided, they may have been off in the weeds in their theology, but nevertheless they were brothers, and he didn't approach them slamming them, demeaning them, he approached them trying to instruct them. He did point out the foolishness of their, their lack of thought, behind what was presented to them. But not in such a, a belittling terms. He's just saying, I'm surprised that, that, that you, you've taken no thought about this and you've allowed people to come in and be with you, to, to bring you into this way of thinking. And then he lays out this discussion to let them know that it's not by the keeping of the law that you are righteous before God. And he uses this example of this covenant between men. It, it, it basically is this. When someone of man initiates a covenant with another man or an agreement, that you can't then come in and nullify it. I guess there's a good example I can give you in Scripture Remember when Isaac was old, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Isaac was old. Jacob came in to deceive him and pretend he was Esau, the older brother. The promise, really, of the blessing needed to go to Jacob, but how Jacob did it was questionable. So Jacob deceived 
Isaac couldn't see, made him a great meal that Esau would always make him. He tasted it. His ears heard a different voice than Esau, his older son. But when he felt his arms, they dressed him up in such a way where they were hairy and bristly. And, and he's like, and then he put on, he put on Esau's garment. And he says, you smell like and, and feel like Esau. You sound like Jacob. And he's like, no, no, I'm Esau. And he's eating the food and he says, man, this is good. I'm ready to bless you. He gave a blessing upon him. Firstborn blessing. Esau comes in with the same meal and he said, here, I made your meal, Father. I got it all ready for you. He goes, who are you? Well, I'm your son Esau. And he's like, oh, I've been deceived. Esau was crying and saying, but don't you have a blessing for me? He goes, I gave it to your son, your brother. I couldn't change it. I, I, I made this agreement and could not change it. So he gave him another blessing, not much of a blessing. Uh, you know, he was going to serve the other brother. But what I'm pointing at is when man invokes something and they put something in motion, the way the, the, the culture was, you couldn't change it after that. So what he's alluding to, that even among men you can't change it. So when God gave a blessing to Abraham and he blessed him with this covenant relationship of faith because Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness, that just because the law came into place afterwards, it had no power or authority to change the initial blessing because God made that covenant, God invoked it upon Abraham and his future seed, which we'll see as Christ. So once God did that, nothing could change that. It, it can't be reversed. You see, the Judaizers were saying, well, that was well and good for Abraham, but once the law came through Moses then it disnullified that and now righteousness is obtained by keeping the law. This is where Paul enters into that argument, that debate and says, uh-uh, even our own culture says it can't be changed. And how much more if God initiated it? Not mere man. God initiated He's not going back on what he initiated. So this is the argument, this is the rebuttal to what they're trying to declare that about the law coming in and changing everything and now we're held to the law instead of grace. It moves on in verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promise made. He saith not, and to seeds of many but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. That's a powerful statement. When the promise was given to Abraham, it was conferred upon Abraham, and obviously the descendants of Abraham were, were brought into that blessing, but this promise was conferred unto Abraham and future projected to be, from our vantage point, already to be from God's, but upon his son, Jesus Christ. It would be that seed. And the seed would be Christ who was born. Kind of like in Genesis chapter 3, when God pronounced the blessing or the promise that upon Eve, that thy seed will crush the serpent's head or the seed of the serpent. Now, he will bruise the heel of thy seed, but thy seed, it was a picture of the future of Christ coming. And it was singular. And he's saying the same thing here, is that promise was to Abraham and his seed that it would be through Christ that in the same token as Abraham that he believed God and it was counted on to righteousness, that Jesus Christ would have that same promise bestowed that all who believe on him, it would be counted as unto righteousness. So it was passed to Jesus Christ. 
So it was speaking of something of the Lord. In, and you can find that just for reference in Genesis 22, verses 15 to 18, you can see this promise. In verse 17, it says this, And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. It cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. And here, there's a, a little, at the appearance, a discrepancy. And I, I will explain it. Um, I'll move through it quickly, but I'll explain it. It says 430 years. Well, we know there is a time frame between Abraham and, and also Moses and the law of five, 600 years. So where is this 430 years coming from that is being described here. And in, in the best that I've been able to dig this out and research, I think it's important to note a couple things. God himself appeared unto Abraham and made this covenant, this promise with him. It was initiated by God himself and put into action. And as we know, once that is put into action, it is invoked, it cannot be altered or changed. So the law could not come in and change everything that this covenant uh, established as God had decreed it to Abraham. The second thing is that the covenant relationship with the Jewish people, God always refers to himself in, in just about all cases as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He refers to him in that way. And it's interesting that God appeared to Abraham and gave him that promise, entered into that covenant, that it will be by faith that you will receive God's righteousness. It is by faith that you are made justified or made right before God. He gave it to him in Genesis 22, verses 15 to 18. God later appears to Isaac. And it's interesting. Now, this is God himself, not through an angel, but God himself appeared to Abraham. God himself appeared to Isaac in Genesis 26, 23 to 25, and he reconfirmed that covenant. He, he, he reconfirmed it with Isaac. God appears to Jacob and he does the same thing. He reconfirms it with Jacob. And I think God did that because he didn't want this confirmation of the covenant to follow down the wrong seed or it would have went to Ishmael. Well, we have claim on that. I am not the God of Ishmael. Not that he didn't create Ishmael, and Ishmael would be a great nation. He, he declared that to Hagar. But he said, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac. Now from Isaac, it wasn't going to go to Esau, and the God of Jacob. So God physically came down and spoke to each one of them in confirming this. I think it's important to see the last one I talked about, about Jacob. So I ask you, turn to Genesis 46. Genesis 46. In Genesis 46, it says here, remember Jacob was renamed Israel. God had changed his name and gave him the name Israel. In Genesis 46, let's just begin in verse 1. It says, And Israel took his journey with all that he had 
and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices unto the God of his father, Isaac. And God spake unto Israel in the vision of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here am I. He said, I am God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will make of thee a great nation. I will go down with thee into Egypt, and I will surely bring thee up again. And Joseph shall put his hand upon thy eyes. And Jacob arose from Beersheba, and the sons of Israel carried Jacob their father and their little ones and their wives in the wagons which Pharaoh had sent them to carry them. So here Jacob arose and he went to Egypt. God met him, God declared, God revalidated the promise to him that do not fear, I will make you a great nation. Who did he say that to prior? He said it to Abraham. He reconfirmed it to Isaac. Now he reconfirms it to Jacob. So Jacob and his whole clan enter in to Egypt. Turn to Exodus. Exodus 12. And let's read what it says right in the beginning. Well, not in the beginning of the chapter, but let's read what it says beginning with verse 40. Now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. That's where the 430 years come, came from. But let's read on. I want to point this out. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the self same day, because remember, we're looking for this time frame of the promise by God to the beginning of the, of the law, the giving of the law, 430. It says, and it came to pass at the end of 430 years, even the self same day it came to pass, that all the host of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It is a night to be much observed unto the Lord for bringing them out of the land of Egypt. This is that night of the Lord to be observed of all the children of Israel and their generation. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover there shall no stranger eat thereof, but every man's servant that is brought for money, for thou, when thou hast circumcised him, thou shalt therefore eat. The foreigner and the hired servant shall eat. In one house shall they be eaten. Thou shalt not carry forth out of the flesh, out of the house, neither shall thy break the bone thereof. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. That is the beginning of the law of God given. He, he instituted the Passover, a law of God that you've got to keep it. So that is showing that from when Jacob heard from God to the first instant, we think of the Ten Commandments and the Mount and the Tablets, the law was actually given, started, started here because God instructed them in the Passover. This is how you keep it. This is what you do. 430 years was that span. So just hope that, you know, if you ever run across, well, the Bible says 430, and really it was this, and it's like, no. You don't understand your scriptures. It was exactly 430 years from the last committed, visible, you know, appearance of God, of the blessing, to the beginning of the giving of the law. You can turn back. In 
in verse 18. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. There are, there are two things that I see in Scripture. There are conditional promises and unconditional promises. The unconditional promises is what's being spoken of here, and that is, is basically something that Paul is trying to declare. That, that the only way, uh, well, it is through faith. Well, let me, let me back you up. Paul's trying to state there's a couple things. A covenant that's made by God can be unconditional or it can be conditional. The unconditional types uh, are different than the conditional. A conditional type is this. It says in Isaiah, perfect peace is to those whose mind is stayed on thee. What's the condition of perfect peace? Keeping your mind on the Lord. That's the condition. Uh, another one that you'll find in James, it says, it says, resist the devil and he will flee. There is a condition. You must resist the devil unconditional after the flood god steps in i will never flood the earth again the whole earth to destroy man i will never do that doesn't matter what man does god says i'm never doing it that way you can't change it you can't alter it it's unconditional another unconditional one that i love in hebrews 13 5 it says for he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Unconditional. He even adds that at the end of Matthew, in Matthew 28, where he says, For I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I love that. In, in Philippians 1, 6 is an unconditional be you confident of this very thing that he that begun the good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ doesn't say if afterwards. He declares it. God declares unconditional and he con declares conditional. I have found that when God declares these unconditional, you know what they do? they actually encourage my heart and motivate me to do right for, to receive the blessings of the conditional promises. I'm like, wow, Lord, you're never going to leave me nor forsake me. I, I, I want to do right. I want to resist the devil so he flees. I want to keep my mind on you so that I can have that perfect peace. The unconditional promises are there to motivate you and encourage you that God is faithful and he will hold up his end. And I have those guarantees and that kind of motivates me to do other good things. For example, if you're in a relationship and you're unsure if it's going anywhere or ever going to last, you're not going to give it your all. But if you're confident that this is for keeps, Till death do you part, you're going to pour into it a lot more. So God gives these conditional and unconditional, and, and so this is an unconditional thing that God has declared to the people. And so he says again in verse 18, for if the inheritance of the law um, be of the law, it is no more a promise, but God gave it to Abraham of, by promise. He gave it unconditionally. Wasn't determined on the law, nor could it then be determined on keeping the law. It was determined on one thing, a promise to Abraham. And what did Abraham have to do? I guess you can say there's one thing. He had to receive it. He had to believe. 
He received it. And, and when you receive those kind of things that God has for us, man, and then you reassure yourself in these things that are true, it keeps the other things at bay. And then if I do stumble over the other things, then what do I need to do? I need to confess it. I need to repent from it. I need to ask God, forgive me, Lord. I went astray. Forgive me. I, I did this. And then he, you know, I, I repent. He forgives. And then I get going again. And I'm like, okay, I let my mind get so far out on other things, Lord. I ask you to forgive me. I repent of this. I doubted you. I, I whatever. And I ask you, forgive me of this sin. I come into a right relationship. Lord, I want my mind to be stayed on you. I thank you that you're always with me. I thank you that he that's in me is greater than he that's in the world. I thank you for these sure things that I can hold on to. And now I want to stay in this right place before you. So it, it, he's just trying to point that these things that God promised to Abraham and then passed on through Christ we're not going to be changed by the law and could not be changed by the law. Let's look at uh, the next verse. Verse 19. Wherefore then serveth the law, it was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. The law was added because of man's sin, man's transgressions. And so it says, but the scripture has concluded, no, I'm sorry, now a mediator, verse 20, is not a mediator of one, but God is one. The law was brought to us because of man's sinful nature. It was sent to show us our wrong, to declare then the blessings of God if we follow it and the curses that come from disobedience. Though the law was dispatched by God through angels, you note that in Acts chapter 7, verse 53, it was then taken and Moses was now the mediator from God to the Jewish people. A mediator is a helpful place or person to have when you need a go-between between two parties. God would give Moses the law, Moses would pass on to the people. The people would be disobedient and, and cry out and ask God to forgive them Moses would go before God and plead their cause. He was the mediator. We know we have a mediator between God and man, and that's Christ, and we're grateful for him being our mediator. But what he's trying to say that in this enactment that he did with Abraham, it was not through anyone else, it was God directly, and it was a promise then to that seed. And Abraham did not intercede in any way on behalf of the people. This was a covenant. It was of a different nature is all it's trying to tell us. That it, 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 was, it was handled differently. Let's continue. Verse 21. Is the law then against the promise of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. Uh, but it couldn't. It, it, it couldn't give life. It was unable to, the law. And then it goes on and says, But the scripture has concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we are kept under the law, shut up onto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. The, the, the understanding of kept is basically placed under guard, held in custody. And then shut up is actually closed in, or many translations will use imprisoned. That we are basically... The law has made us locked up. We're prisoners now. 
this is our jail cell, which is the law, waiting for the faith of Christ, knowing that this can't free us, this can't transform us, this is here to contain us, but we're looking for the day when we are totally pardoned from this, and that is going to come from Jesus Christ. So the law was put in place for a purpose because of man's sin. It continues with the reason of the law, and it says here in verse 24. Um, well, before I read that, I wanted to, I, I thought the law, the law itself, it had a purpose. It would reflect upon man their sin nature because it would tell you what to do and what not to do, and then when you went against it, you realize I must be a sinner. I'm not as righteous as I thought I was. Many people would be, I think I'm righteous. And, and then Jesus would come in and say, oh yeah, you think you're righteous? If you even look on a woman to lust, you committed adultery. Oh, you think you're righteous? And he pointed out the evidence that you are not. The law was meant to tell you you're not. Uh, the, in James, it talks about the, the, the perfect law of liberty being like a mirror. When, when, you, when you look in a mirror... It, it can only tell you that, that you're a wreck. You know, you, you, you look terrible or whatever. You got dirt on your face or, man, I, you know, your outfit is wrinkled and doesn't even match. The mirror does those things. It can't change you. There are many mornings I, I look in the mirror, I grab my toothbrush, I brush my teeth, I, you know, rinse my, my mouth and everything. I look up in the mirror and inevitably, I got some toothpaste stripping off my chin. And the mirror is to point that out. I have never had the mirror say, Hey, Kirk, let me get that for you. <laughs> and if I did hear the mirror say, Hey, Kirk, let me get that for you, you better be looking for a new pastor. Okay? <laughs> never happened. The mirror can only show me the fault. And so what he's saying is, this, this law cannot change you it's trying to corral you and contain you and 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 keep you from really killing yourself and but it but it's only meant to be that temporary thing that's trying to hold you in place until the one that was promised the seed that came through abraham would then bring the justification you need the forgiveness the transformation that you need and that came through jesus christ Let's move on. It says in verse 24, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. The word schoolmaster is a little different than we would think. We, we would think teacher, school teacher. But in that time, the schoolmaster was usually a servant or someone that would take the children when they were young. The Greeks did this a lot. Would take the children when they were young, and the schoolmaster would be the one that would then train them protect them, instruct them, and discipline them all through their growing up until they reach maturity or an adulthood. In America, that age might be 35 when a kid moves out of the basement of the... I know, I don't know an adult. But, but you move in that they would be with you all the way until that point, and then you would be brought into maturity, and now you no longer needed the schoolmaster because now you were brought into a place of maturity. What they're saying is that after faith is come, after you've accepted Christ as your Savior, after you believe in his finished work of the cross, then you no longer need the school master, the law following you around. You don't need that. 
that we might be justified by faith. What I, what I like is that Jesus has actually done all the work for us. That, that he is the one that comes in and now completes everything. I don't need the law following me constantly. All I need is Christ. I don't need to hammer people and fall them around with the law. But, but it says, thou shall not. But it says, thou shall not. What they need now is they need Christ. He finishes the work. He justifies the work. He has accomplished the work fully. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 1, and I'll read a few verses. Hebrews 1 verses, um, well, it's just 1 through 3. You can turn or just take notes. It says, God, who at sundry times in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son. Used to be another way. Not that way anymore. Spoken to us by his Son, who has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, the person of God, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of, of the majesty on high. When he purged our sins, he did it. The law couldn't make us righteous. The law couldn't make us perfect. It couldn't purge us. It could say you're a sinner. It could say your face looks a wreck. But it couldn't change anything. But he did. And then get what he did. He sat down because he was declaring it's finished. I did the work. And, and you see that. You see that in Ephesians. I, I love those verses in Ephesians chapter, and we probably get to Ephesians after Galatians, but Ephesians 2, as you look in verse 2, I'll read a few verses, verses 8 through 10. It says, For by grace you are saved, what? Through faith, not the keeping of the law. It is not yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, not of keeping the law, lest any man should boast, for what? For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. It's his work. So now what do I do? I trust in God's finished work, God's completed work, God's continuing work. I trust in him. And are confident that he that begun will complete. So it's him. You know, you can make note of this in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. It talks about there that in the latter days that you're not going to need any law, anyone to teach you, but God's going to teach you. He's going to put his spirit inside you. Oh, let's turn to it. I'm almost done. Let's turn to it. Jeremiah. You'll see, you go past Isaiah and you'll get to Jeremiah 31. Look what it says beginning in verse 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. That's the covenant of Moses. That's the covenant of the law. Out of the hand of Egypt, which my covenant they break, which we are prone to do it. We can't keep it. Although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel, after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in the inward parts and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, 
Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest, saith the Lord, and I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. We are seeing that unfold, but he put his law on the inside. You know what he did? He put his Holy Spirit. In fact, in John chapter 14, it says he will send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, and he will remind you all the things that I said. He places his Holy Spirit inside me. The law was inadequate, did not have the power to keep man. Very clear, they broke it. God said, you broke it. Even though I was a husband to you, you broke it anyway. I don't have the power to keep it. I mean, you know, you might think I do, but uh -uh, I don't. But you know who does? God's Holy Spirit. He has the power to keep it. He has the power to perform it, transform it. He says, I'm going to place my spirit inside you. I am so grateful for the Holy Spirit. Because that which I was in, not able to do, he is more than able. He will continue to transform me day by day and complete me at that day when I step into glory. So he is more than able to do that. Let's jump back and try to wrap this up. Galatians, verse 26. Let's read it to the end. It says, For you are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as of you as have been baptized unto Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You must keep this verse in context with the other verses. It is not saying that there is no male or female and we're all binary. We are not. It does not declare that in the text. It is declaring that because the other scriptures plainly show a clear distinction between male and female that are throughout the Bible. But in fact, even God, when God created man and woman, male and female, as you see in Genesis chapter 1, at the end of it, after he created male and female, he said it was good. He declared that they are good just the way they are. Don't have to alter them. I think I did a pretty good job in making them. Don't have to change them. In fact, if you read the text, he said at the end there, everything is very good. So he declared it is very good. To keep this in context, what he's saying is there are no subcategories in the Christian faith. There is not, well, who are you? Well, I'm part of the Christian Gentile tribe what about you well, i'm part of the christian jewish tribe i'm part of the christian slave tribe i know what it means to serve i'm part of the christian freeman tribe boy do i know how to be free i'm part of the christian male tribe i'm part of the christian female tribe it is telling us there were no subcategories that god accepted all and we are all Christians, or as the text says, children of God. That's the category. No subcategories. Now, the Jews, they had a, a, a kind of a prejudice that they were living through of that culture in that time. You see, the Jewish people were against Gentiles, they were against slaves, and the Jewish men were against, really, the women. They, they thought less of them as women. In fact, the Jewish males had this saying, and this would show up in their prayers on a regular pray, um, basis. They would say this, 
I thank God I am, not, I am a Jew and not a Gentile. This would be in their prayers. I thank God I am free and not a slave. And this one will get you. And I thank God I am a male and not a female. That would be their, their prayers. That would be that. The Romans of the time, they didn't have a good outlook on, on women either. In fact, the Romans would instruct the young men, listen, son, when you grow up, you know, you need at least three women in your life. Okay, dad, three women. One, you need a wife. She's the, 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 the necessity for legal matters. Two, you need a concubine, second class wife. She's for your physical desires. Three, you need a mistress. She's for adventure. That's what they would taught them. You know, they would teach them. I remember, I, just the other day, I was telling Kathy that. I was saying, Kathy, you know what the Romans would have? I'm, I did. I'm telling her this. And you know how she responded to me? She immediately responded how, you know, let me tell you about the fall of Rome, Kirk. <laughs> she did. And then she goes on and she goes, and the destruction of the Romans, especially the male Romans. And I'm like, why is she going off? I'm just telling her about what she... And then I said, honey, I may have some Roman blood in me. She says, well, if you do, you will immediately have a full blood transfusion in your very short-lived future. I realize I'm getting nowhere with this woman. I'm, I'm getting nowhere. So she said that to me. God respected the women. And he gave them a place of honor that wasn't there in this time. And he gave the outsider a place of acceptance that wasn't there. Ooh, those Gentiles, ooh, those Samaritans. And he gave those that were slaves and in prison a place of honor where they too, whether they're in prison to sin or in prison as an outcast, a slave or wrongdoing, they could come before the throne of grace. God gave that open door for mankind. God is one that, that has a door wide open for us and great unconditional promises. And again, those unconditional promises, they motivate me to walk in the ones that are conditional because what they do is they move me to a place where I want all the blessings of God to fall upon me. May you know that you are loved by God and that if you put your faith in Jesus Christ and the work that he did on the cross and that he died in your place and mine for our sin and you believe he rose again, the Bible says you have now stepped in by this covenant of faith, a covenant given way back to Abraham before the law and made possible through the giving of his son Jesus Christ. And I encourage you, enter into that. Accept him as your Savior. And if there's anything, any junk in your life that you're looking to get rid of, remember the promises. He will not leave you nor forsake you. He wants to walk you through those difficulties and bring you out on the other side. As we go to prayer for communion, may our Lord speak richly to your heart and bring you into that right place that he established through what we're celebrating in the breaking of the body or the bread and the, and the cup. So, Lord, we pray that you would prepare our hearts, that our hearts would be prepared for this time, this communion time, this opportunity that you give us to come and be clean because of what you have accomplished and to be brought back into that place, Lord, that place that you have for us through your Son, Jesus Christ, 
because by faith we do believe that you have made us right. You have justified us by the work of the cross. So we thank you for this time together and ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.